All right. So today we're going to be thinking about the how we can share the gospel with people who see uh, Christians or Christian belief as intolerant. Um, we, we certainly live in an age where, you know, tolerance is upheld as something very important. Um, but as we'll talk about a little bit more later, I think the, the word tolerance now means something a bit different to what it meant, uh, you know, 10, 15 or so years ago. Um, I, I guess we, we live in a time where uh, the philosophy of individualism, it's become a bit of a runaway steam train in our culture. It's sort of a, the, the individual is, is, you know, largely what matters. And, and it's true, individuals um, do matter, uh, but so, so does the community as well. Um, but it, individualism, it's, it's got its roots, Sorry, let me. It's roots in the Enlightenment period, you know, 300, 350 or so years ago. Um, that, that was a time which uh, saw us say uh, goodbye to revelation, that is biblical revelation. I think it probably came from a sense of uh, weariness from the amount of wars that were fought, uh, the amount of persecution that happened between uh, di different. Um, church denominations and uh, different religions. Uh, so, you know, I think some of the people of the time, the, the key thinkers thought, well, you know, um, religion's a problem. Let's just kick it to the curb and be done with it. And, and we said hello to reason. Uh, human reason was seen as, I guess, the salvation of uh, humankind and, and the way to go uh, for the future. But the problem was... Yeah, we ended up saying goodbye to both in, in due course. Uh, you know, re revelation uh, seemingly had let us down. Uh, reason had let us down because the smartest people uh, going around couldn't agree on basic moral or e ethical issues. And, and so at, at some point uh, in probably what we would call the postmodern period, uh, we say, Hello to, to relative truth. Uh, in other words, you know, my truth. So what, what, what is true for one person is uh, not true for someone else. But even if someone has complete, people have completely different uh, truths, uh, they're both true, even if they, say, they seem completely, uh, completely separate. Um, objective truth was, uh, you know, obliterated in a storm of uh, human rebellion against God and disillusionment and confusion uh, as to um, how far reason can take us. Um, you know, and this, this left us to see truth, as I said, as relative to the individual. You know, no government, no institution, no person can, can oppress me by not affirming what I believe. And we end up with uh, autonomy or freedom as being the, 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 the key, I guess, modern value uh, that, that Western culture lives by is that the individual should have complete freedom and complete autonomy uh, to, to believe whatever truths, inverted commas, they want to believe. Uh, and that, that's followed by probably the, the second celebrated virtue is authenticity okay so so we need to have the freedom to live out the uh, authentic person that we identify ourselves as being but we must be true uh, to to who we think we are uh, and uh, no one has a right to, to question that you know uh, you can't question someone else's truth and so I think in this environment, the church has gone from, I guess, initially being a, a pillar of society. And then and at some point it became a respected institution. And then it became, the church became largely irrelevant up to this point where the, the, the church has actually seen not by everyone, I don't want to overstate it, but 
by in in powerful circles as a moral evil um, in our current progressive age, uh, and so you know it's been it's been a, a gradual shift, probably over the last I don't know 100, 150 years from church being a pillar of society to to a moral evil, um, you know. Not, not, not everyone, like I said, to be fair, would see the church in, in this dark light. Uh, but our cultural informers, which is the media, entertainment and big business, that they've been strongly influenced in this direction uh, through, through the processes of, I guess, what's called cultural Marxism. I'm not sure if this is a term we've heard or um, have given much thought to. Uh, you've probably heard of Karl Marx, the father of Marxism. Mm -hmm. He his idea was that uh, what was he, he was around the end of I think the the nineteenth century, and uh, he, his idea was that uh, that the ruling class oppresses the working class, uh, causing them uh, as well as oppression, alienation, and you know the working class needed to to rise up and overthrow the ruling class through the means of uh, violent uprising. Um, so so, so that was, that was, that's classical Marxism, <coughs> as, as I understand it. Um, cultural Marxism is a bit of an um, offshoot from that. You know, cultural Marxism is about liberating uh, humanity from uh, social institutions and conditions. So... That would be liberating people from institutions such as family, uh, church, uh, business, traditional views, liber liberating people from authority. You know, all, all of those institutions which would impinge on our autonomy and freedom to live out the our authentic self. Um, you know, these these institutions in the view of cultural Marxism, ha have no right to do this. Uh, and so with cultural Marxism, though, this uprising, it doesn't come through the means of uh, violent uprising. Um, it, it comes through actually capturing the um, culture-making institutions of our time. So that would be schools, uh, unis, uh, media, entertainment, uh, the, the authorities. And, you know, we, we, we've seen this really on the rise, I think, since probably the 60s. Uh, you know, I, I wasn't around then, but, you know, when the, the whole sexual revolution type thing started, I think where we're at now, you know, can be traced significantly um, the, a, a bit of an uptick in that direction uh, from the 60s. The ideas were around before the 60s, but uh, I, I think we sort of see it um, kicking off uh, well and truly around that time. Um, and the, the institutions I mentioned, like media, big business, entertainment, uh, w w when they focus on the church, usually they, they don't really paint us in a very good light, okay? Um, they're, they're acting as cultural influences um, over other people, um, you know? The, now, as a result of the Enlightenment, through this cultural Marxism thinking, truth has become something that's relative, you know? My truth, your truth, you know, it's all true, it doesn't matter. Um, relative, not objective, okay? Um, people in this view, people must be free to live out their authentic self. Uh, you know, therefore, you know, we need to tolerate every belief, every philosophy, every lifestyle. But if that's the, the problem is, if that's the basis, you know, what basis does that leave us to object to philosophies uh, such as like the, the Nazis, the... Uh, the Ku Klux Klan, you know, if, if everyone can live out their freedom, their authentic self, there's no moral basis to object to such things. Um, it's one of the weaknesses, I think, with, with this line of thought. 
Um, and the, the church is seen as an institution which, is, which has oppressed people from having their freedom, living out their authentic self, uh, and by association, Christians can be painted as being intolerant and antiquated. Um, I'll stop for a moment there. Um, there's quite a lot. Does, does anyone have any thoughts or comments? You know, have, have you noticed over your lifetime a, a progression sort of similar to what I've described? Hey, Steve, when you were talking about um, the, the, the changes that um, the media, etc., were bringing, um, not so much. I'm not specifically talking so much about the media, but um, about entertainment. I mean, if you look back at uh, even big films, for instance. Um, a, a couple that come directly to mind um, from H.G. Wells' War of the Worlds when the first film came out. The minister was someone who sort of was told to get back and wouldn't, um, was shown as being someone who was going to go up and, and, and get rid of these creatures from another planet and... Um, was easily white, you know, was was killed by the beam. Um, and straight away, it was sort of, oh, we told him not to do it. He, he just wouldn't mm -hmm. listen, typical type thing. Um, and then another one, even more so, Zulu, if any of you remember the old, and this is going, uh, I'm going back a, quite a few years, obviously. The original Zulu, the minister was, uh, uh, was shown as being a drunkard who, um, who hid the fact that he used to drink away and then spout, the, spout how they should be, you know, fighting for God and all this. But in, in the background, he was a drunkard. And there's many, many more um, instances where even back in the, in the 60s and the 70s, <coughs> where people still thought that a lot of the countries were sort of still Christian based where if these type of things were sliding in, you know, the, the predicting yeah. of the, the minister as being a, a buffoon, a silly, you know, someone not to be listened to. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks, Kev. Yeah. Uh, and anyone else? Well, well, with the H.G. Wells one, that's um, at the turn of the century, well, turn of the 19th century. Mm. Oh, sorry, 20th century, yeah. yeah. 1900, well, it's 1898 was written. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So that's, that's even before um, the 1960s. So it's been there for a while. Yeah, that's right. It, it's been a line of thought that, that's, that's been around for a long time. Um, but, you know, I, I, I think it took a significant uptick probably in the 60s. Um, things sort of started to accelerate um, towards what we've got now. Even um, yeah, Diane. I, I think that in the book, though, the minister was predicted as someone who ended up being a bit of a martyr because he ended up getting killed whereas in the film he, he was made out to look like a, a fool for doing it okay thanks Kev. I, can't, I, I can't i can't remember correctly but yeah i thought he was a bit of he, he went mad because yeah. uh okay. his wife died yeah uh, yeah all right thanks paul um die yeah, I was just going to say, you've only got to look at the announcement this morning made by the government for the woman of the year. It doesn't have to be a woman. It can be a man who thinks he's a woman. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's right. you hear that? Yeah. The funny thing is, uh, I'm going off on a little bit of a tangent here, so I'll say it and then I'll move on, but, um, you know, 
uh, the, the idea of um, men becoming like biological men becoming women, it's actually starting to impinge on women's rights that have been Absolutely. fought hard for for a long time. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, I'm going to talk about, you know, the, the um, terminal contradictions a little bit later that some of these worldviews have. You just can't make them fit. Um, mm. They're just totally uh, in yeah, opposition off the planet. to each other. But <laughs> it, it doesn't seem to matter. They do um, make them fit, but they make them fit somehow. Yeah. <laughs> but see, like, um, the ministers in the old days, they used to be sexual um, predators too, wouldn't they, in the old days? Uh, you know, I, I guess you'd probably have some, but, yeah, I wouldn't say all yeah, of them. I, I know they're all, but that, that would have hurt. That would have hurt us. That would have hurt. Yeah, yeah. The Christians yeah. too, wouldn't it? Oh, definitely, you know, uh, all, all things like that, hurt people and drag yeah. God's name through the mud. Yeah, definitely. Yep. Certainly didn't help anyone. Um, yeah. Thanks, Rick. All right, so the question is, like, how, how can we as Christians hold exclusive views uh, that we do as Christians, uh, that Jesus is the one way to God and Jesus' way is the way, how can we hold such exclusive views in a culture that celebrates openness, diversity, inclusivity, and tolerance for everything? Um, you know, some, some people, you know, I don't know that a lot of people, but some people would put us on the same level as the Ku Klux Klan. You know, they say <laughs> one race is superior to all others. Um, and, and as Christians, I guess we say one religion is superior uh, to all others. Um, therefore, some people will draw the line that, that Christians are totally intolerant. Um, now, again, that's not going to be everybody, uh, but, you know, the thought's out there and it's, it's being pushed by, you know, the, 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 social, um, the, the social informers. Um, so. To some degree, we are intolerant, aren't we? We're intolerant of... God is intolerant of sin and that makes us and he's intolerant of any other way to, to God. Yeah, and so that's something I'm going to come back to a little bit later. You know, is intolerance inherently a bad thing? Um, but we'll discuss that a little bit more later. What I'm going to do, I'm going to share with you a video. Now, my very clever uh, Laura showed me how to embed the video into the slides. So... Hopefully, I don't need to go fussing about trying to get the video <laughs> off YouTube. Um, so I, I will ask: Can everyone just mute yourselves while we put I put the video on? Um, I hope it doesn't have the box in the grey box in it. If it does, I'm I'm sorry, um, but I guess just try to um, make the best of it you can. Um, and and in the video. Uh, the guy we've heard him before, Sean McDowell, he talks about, uh, he, he defines the term intolerance uh, and tolerance by, you know, um, the reverse, which I think is helpful because when sometimes when we're talking about intolerance, we're not talking about what someone else means by intolerance. So it's always good these days when you're having conversations to ask people, what do you mean by that? Because uh, we, we may be using the same words, but in a completely different way, because uh, the meanings of words just change very rapidly these days. Um, so let, let's have a look at this. I'll, I'll mute myself as well. Intolerant. Most of us cringe at that label, but intolerance can be a beautiful thing. Take a look. Controversial subjects like abortion, homosexuality, and racial equality have created a great divide in our culture. Many people think everyone should be accepted no matter what they believe or do, while others resist friendships with people they view as different or immoral. Sean McDowell, a former high school teacher, and his dad Josh, a best-selling author, address these complex issues in their book, The Beauty of Intolerance. Today, Sean gives insight on building relationships with others who hold completely different worldviews. 
Well, we welcome the author of The Beauty of Intolerance, one of the authors, Sean McDowell. You wrote this with your dad, Josh. But I did. What a what an insightful book, I think. You know, a lot of us have been looking at what's going on in the culture today and saying, what in the world is happening? Where did we lose the, the game here? Your dad has defended faith for us and, and helped us work through that maze for many, many years. Has it always been easy for you to define what you believe and articulate it? You know, my parents did a good job of not just telling me what to believe growing up, uh -huh. but helping me learn how to discover truth. Yeah. For example, my dad would ask us a lot of questions instead of give simple answers, which I think is kind of the way we think? need to parent today yeah. because there's mm -hmm. endless information out there. Yes. We need to help young people learn how to think. So it's been a process for me as much as anybody else. Well, the book is entitled The Beauty of Intolerance with the in in a different color. Just define the title and why you chose that. Well, a while ago, my dad made a shirt and the front of it said, intolerance is a beautiful idea. And of course, when I wear that shirt around, people see that and get offended and give you stark <laughs> looks. But then the back says, Mother Teresa was intolerant of poverty. Bono was intolerant of AIDS. Gandhi of classism and Jesus of hypocrisy. And the point is that there are certain things we should be tolerant of certain yeah. things we should be intolerant of. But the problem is we live in a society where these labels like you're exclusivistic, you're yeah. bigoted, you're intolerant are just thrown out there. Yeah. We need to take the time to think through what is tolerance? How do we really live in conversation in a culture respectfully with people that have very, very different beliefs? Can I just say your book came out in the right year? Well, thank you. <laughs> I mean, really, exactly what you're talking about is what seems to be missing in our culture today mm. and how confusing to young people people is that because you know the the grown-ups the adults the leaders are setting this example of if if I don't like something that you believe or something you stand for then I can't be civil with you how how do we how do we get our young people back on track with this well i think part of the difficulty is we're using the same words like respect dignity tolerance, diversity, but they mean very, very different things to different generations. Yeah. So say millennials and up, even above millennials, tolerance essentially meant I disagree with you, but I still respect you, yeah. your right to believe something different, and I will treat you with dignity and honor even though we differ. Now tolerance means I can't even, if I say you're wrong in your core beliefs and lifestyle, mm -hmm then I'm bigoted and I'm hateful. In fact, to be tolerant means I have to praise beliefs of somebody yeah. else. And if I just say they're wrong, then I'm labeled intolerant. So this, this idea where we use different terms creates a lot of confusion and misunderstanding. So in the beauty of intolerance, we just take a step back and say, okay, what is true tolerance? What's the biblical basis for it? Mm -hmm. What's the philosophical basis for it? What's the historical basis? Where have we gone wrong and how can we get back on the right track? Will you define what, well, you've talked a little bit about it, but traditional tolerance, uh, I think, was something that we used to see in Washington, D.C. You know, <laughs> I mean, I, we could vote differently, but we could reach across the aisle when yeah. that vote was done and yeah. shake hands and leave. Today, I was watching a, a television program where the expression of someone's opinion was so obnoxious mm. because they were saying anybody who's not standing on the turf that I'm standing on is exactly what you're saying. It, anathema, you know, like I, yeah, yeah. I can't even see you as a valuable human being. How do we begin to change that dialogue, Sean? How do we begin to change the thought process that I, you're either with me or you're again me and I, I can't even see your merit? Well, the first thing is, as Christians, we need to really know what we believe and why we believe it, about tolerance, about truth, about all issues. Then we can speak with confidence to people yeah. with a different belief system. But second, and probably most important, is we need to step outside of our comfort zones, because the narrative is that anybody who, you know, if you were an American, you loved apple pie, baseball, and you yeah. were a Christian. Now, if you're a Christian, you're intolerant and bigoted. Yeah. So the way to counter this narrative is if we step out and build relationships with people, very different belief systems, and they see our lifestyle, they see our love, even amidst difference. When the voice comes in that Christians are bigoted and tolerant, their first reaction will be, you know what, I know Christians, and they're not that way. So each of us have to just step out and build loving, gracious relationships with people of very different backgrounds, different races, different belief systems. Mm -hmm. And then they can hopefully see the love of Christ through us to know what real tolerance is. Well, the kind of cultural intelligence, in, intolerance that we're living in today has even crept into the church, which is sad. I, 
I think it has. In fact, really cultural tolerance is this idea that rather than truth is something in God's character that he has expressed and we are to mold our ideas to God's truth, mm -hmm. cultural tolerance says I am the source of truth myself. And we increasingly see this on moral issues where people think if I believe something, you have no right to criticize me yeah. and I can read my truth into the Bible rather than conform my life to what mm -hmm. the Bible really teaches. Well, it's, it, it certainly is an interesting thought to really examine what is intolerance to me and, mm. and how do I, through relationship, make a difference? What advice would you give to parents? Probably exactly what your dad did for you, huh? <laughs> well, yeah, I, I would say, number one, you gotta really build relationships with your kids. <coughs> Excuse me. Mm -hmm. Reach out, build relationships with your kids, but also understand the world that kids are growing up in today what tolerance means, what respect means, what diversity means. And then when we really understand how those terms are understood by a younger generation, I think we can communicate much more yeah. effectively and lovingly. Well, I want to say whether you're the parent trying to figure that out for yourself or someone wanting to lead your children through the maze, The Beauty of Intolerance is a great book to start with. Josh co or I mean, Sean co-wrote this with his dad, Josh McDowell. We've all been reading his books for years. And Sean, you did a great job on this. It's a wonderful book. Well, thanks really. for having me. Highly recommend it. Okay, um, does anyone have any uh, thoughts or comments you want to share after watching that? Anything you agreed with, disagreed with, or questions? Or... I said I want that shirt. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe we can do a bulk order. <laughs> yeah. I reckon it starts some conversations, that's for sure. Yeah, sure would. My, my black belt might come in handy too, wearing that shirt around. <laughs> now you wear the shirt and then your black belt up over the top of it. <laughs> yeah, um, I, I, I think it's something uh, that we should remember the fact that um, the word tolerance and intolerance today has changed to what someone of my generation would mean. Like um, for me, be it, someone would say to me, oh, you're intolerant, it would be a real slap in the face. Um, you know, because to me, they are saying, oh, you just don't understand, you don't want to understand. Yeah. Where it's, I, I think the generation today um, have watered it down a bit. Yeah. Um, so being a bit more understanding of their terminology. And of course, we also have to remember that they live, they, they've they been brought up uh, in, a, in a different sort of upbringing to, to someone like myself. So that would make, make a difference. But as he said, the best thing, you know, the best thing to do is to start the conversations with these people lovingly and openly and, uh, and, and show them rather than try and explain it. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks, Kev. Yeah. Um, and and what the sad reality is our population is growing faster than what the church is. So what that means is, is the church's influence, uh, humanly speaking, it, it is getting smaller. Uh, because it, in reality, even though uh, evangelical churches, from what I understand, are growing, uh, like the, the liberal churches are dying, evangelical churches are growing, but the population's growing faster. So more and more people are getting through life without knowing a Christian. You know, all they know about Jesus and Christians generally is what they hear on the news or see on social media. Um, so that's why it's in, important that we do get out and about uh, amongst non-Christians. Um, all right, let me share my screen again. Okay. Um, so, look, you know, the, the way I see it, I, I think with this whole tolerance movement, has it's got some problems. Uh, you know, I think three of the problems that, that, that I see with it is hypocrisy, contradiction, and and false beliefs. Uh, you know, it, it can it can be 
really hypocritical um this this tolerance movement and it's actually become something called cancel culture uh you know they talked about on the video there where it's gotten to the point in some circles where you know some people will decide i can't be friends with you or i can't associate with you if you don't agree with me but not only that i'll, I'll make sure you that you you have no voice as well um that's cancel culture, and I'll share a couple of examples of, of that soon. Um, but it can be quite hypocritical. Uh, but I reject God's wisdom, but my wisdom is still greater than yours, okay? That's sort of a position what this tolerance thing has. It's like I'll be tolerant of everything I want to be tolerant of, except if your opinion disagrees with mine, I won't tolerate that. So it can be a very hypocritical uh, position to take. And we see people get what we call cancelled if they publicly put uh, put out a view which is different to the group think. Um, now, you know the, the guy I'm about to share. He's a he's a polarizing figure, um, Israel Folau. You know, you, you'll probably remember well a couple of years ago he put out this meme. Um, and look, we, we can argue all day as to whether it's the best way to communicate with people. Um, but, you know, if we really are living in this culture of tolerance where all views are okay and accepted, well, you would have to accept, you know, what Israel Folau was voicing publicly as well. But that's not what happened. Uh, you'll recall he lost his job uh, because of his beliefs. Um, so that's one, one example uh, yeah, another example of the problems with uh, this tolerance movement uh, with the hypocrisy of it all is um, th this lady named Gina Carano. She's an actress um, on the Star Wars Mandalorian series, and she's done some other movies as well, I think. She's a, a former mixed martial arts fighter, actually. And, um, you know, she put up this tweet, uh, uh, you know, probably 12 months or so ago. I don't know if you can read it, um, but it says, Jews were beaten in the streets not by Nazi soldiers, but by their neighbours, even by children. Because history is edited, most people don't realise that to get to the point where Nazi soldiers could easily round up thousands of Jews, the government first made their own neighbours hate them simply for being Jews. How is, how, how is that any different from hating someone for their political views? Now, look, whether you agree with that or not is like, that's, that, that's up to everyone to decide for themselves. But, it, but she put this up. And she was sacked over social media um, by, by the movie company. If we, a, a company which is very vocal about tolerance. So if, if, if we really are so tolerant, why are some views okay and some views not okay? Uh, and there's been, I, I do sort of watch this thing a little bit and there's been countless other examples. So, so should, physical spiritual economic and emotional harm be tolerated to people i would say no it shouldn't be but it seems like if they've if our, some people's views don't meet with the group think well they're fair game um and so i think this is where we've come with this whole tolerance movement at the moment um you know or ha have you heard the, these ideas expressed uh, yeah, you know, how can you advocate removing a woman's choice to abort a pregnancy? You know, this is a really hot, emotive issue. Um, and, and again, this is an issue where, or, although, you know, it comes from people who would say they're highly tolerant, uh, if you disagree, then, uh, you know, you'll get ripped a new one um, from all quarters. Um, however, the, the problem with this uh, pro-choice movement, that is pro-women's choice to terminate a pregnancy, is uh, I, I read about a research, research from a post-abortion um, care clinic. Uh, 1,000 women were surveyed through who came through the clinic. 
73% of women felt pressured to have an abortion. 58.3% of women had the abortion to make someone else happy. 30% had the abortion out of fear they would lose their partner. So to me, that really brings into question, you know, is this really about women's choice? Because it seems like, uh, you know, that choice is not as great as, as what the advocates of pro-choice would have us believe. Uh, and, and we see, you know, again, a, a terminal contradiction come up on, on topics like this. There's a law called Zoe's Law, which is... Uh, before parliament at the moment. I don't think it's been voted in or out just yet. Um, but basically back in 2009, a, a woman was uh, uh, in a motor vehicle accident. And I think she had uh, she was pregnant and the baby, the unborn baby died as a result of the accident. Uh, and so there were calls to have the other driver charged with the death of the unborn child. Now. This caused major problems uh, uh, recently, and you can probably work out why, because of the abortion laws that were put through Parliament. Some people worked out, well, hang on, how can we put this law through, which says uh, people should be held accountable for actions leading to the death of an unborn child, while on the other hand, we uh, advocate it through you know, late term abortion. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's a contradiction. Yeah, it's just something if you're being consistent, you can't have it both ways. But it's it seems like, you know, we're just happy to live with some of these contradictions with these worldviews that are and philosophies that are coming through. Um, another one you might have heard, you know, how can Christians withhold marriage from gay people? Like love, love is love. You, you've probably heard that. Uh, well, you know, firstly, I'd say we're not stopping anyone getting married. Uh, as Christians, we just say we don't agree that it's the way to go. Uh, and I think in a, in a culture of tolerance, you know, we, we should allow, be allowed to have that voice without being um, persecuted for publicly sharing that voice, whereas people have been persecuted for publicly sharing their, their thoughts in the negative on, on that issue. Um, now, of course, hate speech and, uh, you know, wanting people hurt and oppressed, uh, that, that, that's, that's something that as Christians we don't, we don't want any part of for anyone. But, uh, you know, we, 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 uh, in a culture of tolerance, you know, everything's true. Everything's acceptable, yet it does not seem to be the case. Uh, la last one, uh, you've, you've probably heard of, you know, how can Christians not support transgender people? Again, we need to ask, well, what do you mean by support? Okay, you, you need to get, get into what people are actually getting at with the words that they're saying. Sometimes I'll be able to articulate it to you. I suspect sometimes... No, but they won't be able to articulate it so well. Again, uh, with, with the whole transgender thing, I'm not an expert on the topic by any means, but there does seem to be some contradictions with it. Um, a group of doctors from the American College of Pediatricians put out a joint statement saying young children are being permanently sterilized and surgically maimed under the guise of treating a condition that would other, otherwise resolve in 80% of them. This is criminal. That's their statement. That's what that's what these pediatricians were saying, uh, and and I think look, we do want to support transgender people. Uh, we we want to see them live well. Uh, we and, and that that's why you know many Christians would say no to these transition surgeries, um, especially in children. It's not because we've got a problem against them. We need to articulate it's, it's because we do care for them and that's why we share the views that we do. Um, but it always must be done lovingly. I just read a book by Vaughan Roberts, who's a, a minister in England, an evangelical guy. He's, he's same-sex attracted but celibate. 
and, and he writes a book on, wrote a small book on this issue that I read. And, you know, he says as Christians, uh, we need to avoid the two extreme responses. One extreme is just screwing our face up and going, oh, yuck. Okay. The other extreme is just openly applauding people um, who are advocating this transgender philosophies. Um, you know, as people's Jesus, as Jesus's people, we, we need to find um, that loving middle ground. Um, on that topic as well, uh, and then I'll, I'll move on. Uh, John Hopkins Hospital in the US, uh, a hospital that pioneered, pioneered sex change surgery for adults, but then stopped offering it once evidence suggested that patients that were satisfied, okay, they were satisfied with their transition surgery, but their post-surgery psychological adjustments were no better than those who did not have the surgery. So Dr. Paul McHugh, formerly the psychiatrist in chief of that hospital, concluded that to provide a surgical alteration to the body of those unfortunate people was to collaborate in a mental disorder rather than to treat it. Okay, that was the, the words of Dr. McHugh himself. And so we, we as Christians out of love, there's some philosophies that we just cannot support. Remembering that the modern idea of a word tolerance is to agree with and support, not just agree to disagree, but still treat people with respect. There's some things we just cannot support uh, to, to my way of, of thinking. Um, the, the other thing is, how can you say Jesus is the only way to God? You know, well, we don't we don't say it. Jesus does. <laughs> we just agree with what Jesus says. Um, you know, how can you say you're the only ones going to heaven would, would be another accusation of intolerance. Uh, everyone should be able to go to heaven. Well, again, we, we, we don't we're not the ones that are saying um, that Christians are the only ones that go to heaven. Jesus is the one saying that, um, you know. And if Jesus doesn't decide who he lets into his heaven and his new creation, well, who decides then? What's the standard? Does everyone get in? If everyone gets in, you know, eternity and the new creation is not going to be any better or different than what we've got here and now. Um, you know, I, I think to my way of thinking, ultimately, we, we can tolerate that that is respect people with different beliefs in the traditional meaning of a word tolerate. We can do that as Christians and we should do that as Christians, but we cannot tolerate, that is agree and support the modern meaning of a word tolerate, uh, philosophies which our Lord Jesus tells us to sin. Um, he, he is our creator. He, he knows what is best for us. Um, so yes, we, we, we can love people, treat them with dignity, um, just gently agree to disagree. We, we can do that, but we can't give, I don't think, unbridled support to some of this stuff. Um, you know, and look, I, I want to be sympathetic. I, I'm sure a lot of people who put forward these sorts of uh, philosophies and ideas that I've been talking about, they mean well. I, I th think they probably have noble goals in, in mind. Um, but just many of these new philosophies and uh, virtues, they've just got serious questions that come along with them. And uh, some of them, they've just got terminal contradictions as well. And, um, you know, I think as Christians, we obviously need to say, well, you know, Jesus's way is the best way. And, and that's the way what we need to follow, um, you know. And worst of all, Worst of all, this tolerance movement can make Jesus out to be a liar or a madman uh, because Jesus made some very exclusive claims about himself. Uh, Jesus excluded many false beliefs about himself. Uh, John 14, 6, Jesus answered, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. 
Uh, Jesus claims and proves that he is able to do what only God can do in Mark chapter 2, that is, to forgive sin. Uh, John 8, uh, I told you that you would die in your sins if you do not believe that I am he. You will indeed die in your sins. So that's Jesus giving people a loving warning, okay? Uh, as believers, we need to do it sensitively, but that's the loving warning we need to give people as well. If a child was playing in the middle of a road, you wouldn't just leave the child playing there because they were having fun and you don't want to wreck their fun. You, you would get them out of danger. And I think that's, that's what Jesus is doing here with, when he warns about hell and the judgment of sin, you know, he's warning us that there is danger if we continue along the path that we're on. Matthew 28, 20, then Jesus came to them and said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I'm with you always to the very end of the age. And John chapter 10, my father who has given them to me is greater than all. No one can snatch them out of my father's hand. I am, and I and the father are one. Jesus also referred to himself as the resurrection and the life, the bread of life, the good shepherd, the living water, Jesus makes all these claims about himself, which are exclusive. Um, and, you know, uh, Jesus rules out that all beliefs are equal and all beliefs are true. They're not. Um, Jesus rules that out. And there's a great uh, little passage here from C.S. Lewis, the, um, the, the famous Christian uh, philosopher and <laughs> apologist um, from the mid uh, mid 20th century, early to mid 20th century. He says, I'm trying here to prevent anyone saying the really foolish thing that people often say about him, that is Christ. I'm ready to accept Jesus as a great moral teacher, but I don't accept his claim to be God. That is the one thing we must not say. A man who was merely a man and said the sort of things Jesus said would not be a great moral teacher. He would either be a lunatic on the level with a man who says he's a poached egg, or else he would be the devil of hell. You must make your choice. Either this man was and is the son of God, or else a madman or something worse. You can shut him up for a fool, you can spit at him and kill him as a demon, or you can fall at his feet and call him Lord and God but let us not come up with any patronising nonsense about being a great human teacher. He has not left that open to us. He did not intend to. I'll take a breath for a second. Does anyone have any thoughts or comments you want to share? Um, the Sorry, yeah, go. Angela, um, I think I was just thinking as you were talking, like, I think we can also be quite quick to want to say what we think as Christians as well because we do feel we know the truth. Um, yeah. I think we also need to probably, even if we're not um, affirming of others' beliefs, we need, we need to be willing to listen to their stories, their backgrounds and where they're coming from Many people, are, as you were kind of alluding to, I think people are coming to these philosophies possibly from, you know, experiences in their lives or, or pain or, or things that have happened to them um, and they've found um, that these philosophies have, um, you know, made sense for them. Um, yeah, so I'm just thinking, I was just thinking in terms of like relating to people and sharing the gospel with people and building trust like we need to show that love and and just listen as well but not not obviously affirm but he, hear them out and um build relationship with them yes i agree thanks angela yep
All right. So, so far I've gone through sort of where our current, I suppose, permissive liberal culture has come from. Uh, and look, even as I say it, you know, I guess we need to be careful of how we label um, different beliefs and, and people. Um, but for lack of a better term, I've gone through where our current cultures come from to where it is. I've gone through what I see as some of the problems uh, associated with the, the, the worldviews that we have in the West at the moment. And now let, let's have a think about a, a better story. I guess what we want to do, as Angela said, rightly said, is we want to listen well. It's that verse I shared last week from James 1, be quick to listen and slow to become angry. Um, you know, the Bible tells us Jesus didn't come to judge uh, and so n neither should we judge. Um, you know, we have to make wisdom calls on what's right is wrong, right and wrong, uh, but, but we, we need to not judge the goodness and the worth of other people, but that's what we must not do. Um, so we need to show people uh, how Jesus fulfills and gives us a better story than what it is they're trying to achieve. We want to show them how Jesus does it better. We want to show them openness is important now. So we want to show them Jesus' openness. You know, the woman at the well, Jesus was smashing through multiple social barriers of the time. He was talking to a woman who was would have been considered immoral and sinful. He was talking to a woman, full stop. He was talking to a woman who was a Samaritan. All of those would have been barriers against any self-respecting Jew talking to her. It didn't stop Jesus. He was, he was open to this woman and, and he cared for her need. Uh, the woman caught in adultery in John chapter 8. You know, the self-righteous crowd were ready to stone her. Uh, Jesus stood between them. He put himself before her. And by the time he'd finished, they'd all turn around and walked away. Jesus hung out with tax collectors. You know, you, I'm sure you know by now they were hated people back in Jesus' time. But he showed love and kindness to tax collectors. He allowed children to come to him, which you know, children would have been beneath most people in Jesus' day. You know, he touched lepers. You know, he brought salvation and forgiveness to prostitutes. You know, Jesus was open to all, all the people of his time, which the rest of respectful society was closed to. We, we need people to see that Jesus. Jesus welcomes diversity. Revelation chapter 7, verse 9 says, After this I looked, and there before me was a great multitude that no one could count, from every nation, tribe, people, and language, standing before the throne and the Lamb. They were wearing white robes and were holding palm branches in their hands. So, so what do we see here? People from every nation, tribe, and language. There's there's the diversity which the world is trying to achieve, but which Jesus has got right. Inclusiveness is another big thing these days. Jesus was more inclusive than anyone. Um, Ephesians chapter 2, but now in Christ Jesus, you who are once far away have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who has made the two groups that is Jews and Gentiles, so the whole world, if you weren't a Jew, then you were a Gentile, um, one, and has destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility. You know, Jesus is more inclusive than anybody, and it meant so much to him that he died to make it happen. He sacrificed everything. Was Jesus tolerant? Well. He was intolerant of sin. Uh, he was intolerant of hypocrisy, but he loved people. And, and he loved people by calling them out of sin and into his very family. Like, you know, if you want inclusivity, uh, it doesn't get better than that. 
taking people who are against you, making them your friend, and then bringing them into your family. That's what Jesus has done. And he shows grace to all people who want it by rescuing us from our sin. So that's a better story, I think. I think it's a better story than what we see played out in, in the media and on social media and, um, and the like. It sure is. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, and 1 Corinthians 9.22. And, and this comes back to the importance of us as Christians connecting with people connecting with people that we don't necessarily agree with and doing it in a way that is loving and, and that listens. Um, and and I, I use this verse for the overarching philosophy of the ministry that I do. To the weak, I become weak to win the weak. I become all things to all people so that all possible means I might save some. You know, we're Jesus' ambassadors in this broken and hurting world. And, you know, it's, it, it's our job to, to meet people where they're at. That's what Jesus did. He met people where they were at, but he didn't leave them that way. You know, he offered forgiveness and, and brought, brought them out of sin into his family. Now, we're, we're not Jesus, of course, but we're the people who point people to Jesus. That's our job, and um, we, we, we do it patiently, we do it lovingly, we do it by listening, uh, but we are called to point people to Jesus. So I guess this is the, you're probably um, used to seeing this gospel presentation now, and, and so how does what we're talking about fit in to this sort of gospel presentation, um, let let me let let me show you how I think it fits in. Now you wouldn't necessarily. I'm about to sort of go through a bit of a gospel presentation in the context of the Christians as intolerant. You obviously wouldn't uh, give people a speech about this. Okay, what I'm about to say, <laughs> it, it'll sound like a speech. But it's meant, I think, just to help give us a framework in which to know how we can, uh, once we've listened well, uh, guide people to Jesus, okay? Um, particularly people who, are, um, I guess, can be intolerant themselves of Christian beliefs. Um, you know, God created the world. And it was very good. It was created according to his good design. And then humans rebelled against God, okay? And that led to brokenness in creation. And uh, this brokenness led to some people getting applauded and, sadly, some people getting oppressed. Sadly, this is the way it's always been through our human history and, and it's still happening now. And it, it, it grieves God. And so... God wanted to do something about it, and he decided to. That's why he came himself in the form of his son. And he died on the cross to reach out a hand of forgiveness to all people, uh, to, to, to welcome them into his family, whether they are people who are being uh, oppressors who need to repent and be forgiven, or whether it's the oppressed who themselves are sinners in their own way but need somewhere, a family to belong to and a place to be loved. Well, Jesus made that way possible by dying on the cross. And as we accept Jesus, he sends us his Holy Spirit to live in us, live in us to help us to recover and pursue the initial good design God had for us. And the, the, the oppression that uh, is so offensive and difficult to, to, to watch now you know, it won't be with us forever. But there's a time where Jesus will take his family, the people he's invited in, to live in a new creation where people won't be lonely or oppressed or, or sad anymore. They'll be with God and, and he will be with his people. 
Um, so to conclude, there's been a gradual slide to this to this my truth type era that we're living in. It hasn't happened overnight. Um, it, it's been something that's been on the boil for a long time. Uh, we can't tolerate that is in the modern sense of a word, agree and support every truth because not all truths are created equal. Um, but we can be good listeners. Uh, we can be supportive of people, even if we can't necessarily support their beliefs. And we need to be a shepherd to the shepherdless. Yeah, when Jesus, in Mark chapter chapter four, four or six, but um, it, the disciples and Jesus, they were tired, they were hungry, they went to be on their own. The people saw them leave and they followed them. And then Jesus saw the people and he was moved by compassion for them because he, he could see they were uh, sheep without a shepherd. And so what did he do? His compassion moved him to teach them. You know, people who disagree with us strongly, you know, they're not our enemies. Uh, they're, they're lost souls. You know, they're our mission. And, you know, when Jesus looked upon uh, shepherdless people himself in Mark chapter 6, he was moved to help them. He was moved to teach them. And I guess as Jesus' people now, you know, are we called to do any less? A a any thoughts, questions or comments on what we've gone through, folks? So I've probably talked you all into a into silence and stupor. That's <laughs> <laughs> no, good. Uh, yeah, I think, sorry. Um... I, I think for me, I've found it really hard the last um, couple of years because there's just been such an onslaught of media um, pushing all these um kind of values onto us and I found it very hard to continue to have loving thoughts towards people um, when I'm constantly told all of this stuff and I don't know the whole marriage debate just kind of being shoved down our throats in every um, sense of the word um, yeah so it's just been a really good reminder lately to remember that um that we need to continue to be loving to people, even though you know, the media is constantly at us. Um, we need to separate that from the actual people that are that are um, needing to hear about Jesus and needing to be loved. And yeah, thanks, Ellie. I remember when Rob Smith came and did his um, seminar on the LGBT stuff last year. He talked about. You know, we can't support as Christians with philosophies behind it. He said we're to hate the philosophy uh, because it's harmful to people uh, and against God's word, but we're to love the people themselves. And, um, yeah. Have you, Steve, everything you said about God and the people that don't, don't like God, God always comes back. He's got the truth, guys. Always truthful. Yeah, that's you right. Know? God is truthful. Yeah. Because the people right. try and bless me, and it, trying to make him bad, <laughs> but you come back to the truth. Is always mm. brings you back to it. You know. Yeah. And it's always, uh, it's always good. To, it's always good to hear that. Yeah, definitely. And and I think it's good for us to remember too. And I think I'm speaking to myself as much as anyone, not to get Pharisaical, not to become like the Pharisees in the, you know, in, of Jesus' time. Um, but we, you know, need to remember that we're, we're sinners who deserve judgment ourselves, um, but it's only by the grace of God that um, we get otherwise. And so we can't put ourselves over and above anyone else. That's right. Mm. All right, my friends. Well, um, thank you very much for joining in. I 
I hope it was helpful. And I'd like to thank you all for being so regular coming each Wednesday. Uh, you know, um, you know, I hope and pray that God uses some of what we've talked about um, to, for you to, to bring him glory. Um, and, and um, you know, just personally, it's taken a lot of work to put all this together. So it's, it's been nice to be able to, to share it with somebody.